Okay, so Nick Woodall kindly partnered me in this uh, chapter and uh, despite his busy schedule with uh, the editing of the, uh <coughs> the uh, book, uh, he, he helped me a lot. Is this, is this, uh, yeah. this one? Okay, uh, so the advantages of fiber optic laryngoscopy are very well known to people who use it uh, day in, day out, including the flexibility and visualization that it gives you for even the most difficult airways. It's least traumatic, provided one knows how to use it and has many other advantages. But obviously, the dexterity required to work it properly is, is a lot more than most of the other pieces of equipment. Most departments now do have the equipment, so having equip, uh, not having equipment should not really be an excuse uh, uh, in, in current practice. So it's not surprising that uh, flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy has found many applications for difficult airway management for both anticipated and unanticipated difficult airway management, also for airway evaluation in difficult cases, for extubation, and also other uses, uh, for example, inserting and checking uh, double lumen tubes, bronchial blockers, uh, checking tracheal and tracheostomy tubes in the intensive care, uh, insertion of nasogastric tubes and for changing tubes. And certainly in my practice over the last... Uh, Just sort of move in a little bit. Yeah. Over the last 15 years or so, uh, it has formed a, a very uh, useful tool uh, in, in my airway management practice. Uh, there were some limitations uh, from the NAP4 uh, audit in terms of fiber optic intubation, uh, particularly because we were not looking at fiber optic intubation practice in, in the UK. So we haven't been able to capture all the cases where fiber optic intubation was used. Uh, we were just uh, able to find out cases in which uh, fiber optic was involved uh, when the inclusion criteria were uh, mentioned. Because of these, some important details of the technique are missing. For example, the exact doses of sedation drugs used or local anesthetics used, and more importantly, how experienced the uh, operators were. However, we've tried to sort of come out with some important messages, uh, uh, sort of defined under the headings of awake fiber optic intubation, mainly related uh, of uh, failure to use uh, awake intubation when it was indicated, of cases of failed fiber optic intubation, mainly awake, and then fiber optic intubation under general anesthesia, both with and without supraglottic airway devices, and then a little note about awakeness endoscopy and checking tubes. Uh, the uh, uh, advantages of awake intubation uh, physiologically are not uh, sort of difficult to understand, but the rationale for awake intubation in a patient such as this is, this guy has a massive supraglottic airway obstruction, but he's actually awake, he's walking around on the ward, he also puts in some beer in his peg tube when he gets a chance. And the question is, if you can... Uh, Put in a tube in somebody like him, almost awake with some topical anesthesia, then you're not crossing any bridges. And if you fail to do it, then you're safe uh, in a patient. So the rationale for doing an awake intubation is, is, is very simple. And fiber optic laryngoscopy has particular advantages in that it allows you to apply local anesthetic through the working channel and to instantaneously check the position of the tube. <coughs> The patient acceptability is very high and the success rate almost approaches 99% in certainly in my practice uh, provided one does the technique properly. So the first category was failure to use awake fiber optic intubation. This was actually the largest category in, in, in the chapter of 18 <coughs> cases where the review panel and reporters considered that an awake fiber optic intubation was an obvious solution to a difficult airway. This was not used and complications which were predictable, i.e. Uh, can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario occurred. All these patients had features of uh, difficulty with either mask ventilation or intubation or both. And in none of these patients, cooperation was considered to be a problem. So they were ideal cases for awake fiber optic intubation. Of these 18, 15 patients were anesthetized by consultants, usually during normal working hours. Half of these were elective. 16 <coughs> could not be intubated uh, eventually, and two suffered uh, hypoxic cardiac arrest, and one died. Um, airway management was considered by the review panel as good in only one case, mixed, good and bad in nine, and poor in eight cases. 
So this is a typical example in, in this category, middle-aged main, lower limb procedure, non-difficult direct laryngoscopy, cervical spine problems, general anesthesia was induced, maintained by a supraglottic airway device, fiber intubation was not attempted uh, at this stage. Uh, during the operation, the supraglottic airway device was either displaced or become obstructed, and then the usual things followed, uh, so there was failure to, to then effectively oxygenate the patient. At this stage, fiber optic intubation was attempted but failed. Eventually, the patient suffered a cardiac arrest uh, and uh, could not be resuscitated. So what we've moved on is, is rather than draw the onus on individual anesthetists and tell them to be experts at fiber optic intubation, the onus is now on the trust and individual anesthetic departments. To say all anesthetic departments should provide a service where the skills and equipment are available to deliver awake fiber optic intubation when it is indicated. So if I just sort of follow it up, this is what we have done in our department is to create an environment which is difficult airway friendly with appropriate equipment, trained consultants, assistants and surgeons who allow you to teach and practice these skills uh, in your environment. The key is to practice it daily so you can maintain and learn skills and when the difficult patients come along, uh, you are able to uh, manage them safely. The second category was uh, the patients who had failed awake fiber optic intubation, of these there were 15, uh, 13 in the operating room, 12 anesthetized by consultants, two on the ICU, uh, both failed, uh, one patient died. A variety of agents were used for sedation, and I'll come, that, uh, uh, come, come to sedation in a minute. Lignocaine was uh, the, the most commonly used topical uh, 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 local anesthetic agent, and most patients had uh, an anticholinergic agent. So good practice there. The airway management was assessed by the review panel as good in two, mixed in nine, and uh, poor in four. There were two main categories of failure. One was to, to uh, uh, visualize the larynx, i.e. failed uh, endoscopy, usually due to uh, patient, uh, lack of patient cooperation, airway obstruction, uh, contamination by blood secretions or debris, or to actually identify uh, structures because of uh, the pathology. The second category was failure to railroad the tracheal tube, which occurred in uh, two patients uh, despite visualizing the larynx. So a case report in the former category, elderly patient anticipated difficult intubation, urgent tracheostomy for a rapidly enlarging base of tongue tumor, Topical anesthesia was achieved. Sedation provided with propofol and remifentanil. Goodness knows why they asked the trainee to do an awake direct laryngoscopy and an air track. So they must be trying things out, I bet. Uh, but anyway, three further attempts. Then subsequently, by a flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy failed. No recognizable anatomy was seen, and um, the situation became a CICV and the intubation was abandoned and a rescue technique was uh, performed. When I talk about successful awake intubation, I do it in the sort of 10 point uh, uh, program and, and I just want to touch on a few of these. Airway evaluation and including a backup uh, plan are very important. These uh, patients are very difficult to intubate with direct laryngoscopy. But if you know how to do it, they will be very easy to do uh, with a, uh, an awake fiber optic technique. You sort of move on when patients have soft tissue problems but are not obstructing. They are still slightly difficult but still not uh, as difficult as the ones with uh, strider. It is usually the operator <coughs> problem here because blood secretions and airway obstructions can make these uh, difficult. The most difficult patients are these who come with stridor. So even the um, role of awake fiber optic intubation in these uh, patients is not 100% uh, recommended, and these should be done by very experienced endoscopies rather than uh, intubation uh, people. So here, the important thing is uh, that you have a plan A, which involves uh, fiber optic endoscopy, nasendoscopy, or laryngoscopy, and the intubation comes secondary. So you have to determine that there is enough space for you to put the tube in uh, before rushing to do it. And this is uh, why the reason uh, for a plan B, which would involve surgical tracheostomy. In this patient who came in A&E with stridor, uh, had uh, um, an end-stage um, 
a supraglottic tumor uh, which was obstructing and you can even see it in, 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 in his mouth. Uh, as you can see, we are performing an awake nasendoscopy in the theater with the surgical team ready. And because I can't actually uh, uh, see any uh, anatomy that would allow me to put the tube in, the surgeon <coughs> takes over and, and awake tracheostomy is uh, performed on the local anesthesia. So we considered nasendoscopy uh, as an important uh, uh, skill and, and we felt that it wasn't used enough, certainly in the obstructing uh, upper airway lesions. Uh, and although it is mainly performed by ENT staff, it is not a skill which is too difficult to learn and we feel most anesthetists should be able to do it. And, and uh, there were examples of uh, good practice where uh, this was performed. The other things which are important are a good uh, endoscopy technique with uh, sedation, upper airway anesthesia and choosing the right sort of tube to railroad. Uh, it is important that uh, the endoscopy is done in a meticulous fashion uh, with the scope in the airspace and I certainly feel that uh, difficult patients should be done uh, in the sitting position. Uh, the aim of conscious sedation is to have a comfortable sedated patient who obeys verbal commands and has amnesia for. So it is actually a luxury. It is for the patient, not for you. If you use it wrongly, the patient will be over or under sedated and, and you will uh, get in trouble. Uh, just skip through these. The important thing is to start sedation before local anesthesia, constantly monitor its effect. Uh, you know, every patient is different to sedate and uh, it is very important that you are able to do an awake intubation without uh, uh, sedation in, in very high risk patients. So the sedation in, in um, the NAP for uh, respiratory depression and apnea and delayed respiratory arrest uh, did complicate sedation in some cases. It was the impression of the review panel that ramifentanil uh, was possibly one drug which was uh, used uh, indiscriminately. And this is the sort of paper I think people would read uh, and say high dose remifentanil without or with minimal topical anesthesia is the way to do an awake intubation. In my view, it's exactly the opposite. You should be able to do uh, an awake fiber optic intubation without any sedation if uh, required. So the recommendation is that uh, awake fiber optic intubation may fail and a safe backup plan should always be worked out in advance. The other recommendation is fiber optic intubation is most effective in cooperative patients. Airway patency and cooperation may be lost by over sedation where complex sedation techniques are to be used. Strong consideration should be given to delegating the provision of sedation to an anesthetist not performing the recal intubation. There were two cases of uh, difficulty in railroading. Both uh, were given general anesthetics. Both were nasal intubations uh, and both required uh, emergency uh, surgical airway. In one patient there was uh, regurgitation, in another there was uh, massive bleeding. So the recommendation here is that following awake fiber optic intubation, general anesthesia should only be induced after the tube has been railroaded and its position is checked. The second main recommendation is that oral fiber optic intubation should be taught and practiced alongside nasal fiber optic intubation so that it can be considered in patients in whom a nasal intubation is not specifically intubate, uh, indicated. Just quickly, fiber optic intubation under general anesthesia, 20 cases, 6 done direct, all fail, 14 with a supraglottic LV device. Uh, or, uh, half of these uh, were successful and half failed. The same problems that occurred with failed awake intubation occurred uh, with uh, uh, fiber optic intubation performed uh, under general anesthesia. And the recommendation is that where fiber optic intubation is considered the optimal method of securing the airway, an awake technique should be considered unless contraindicated. In the ones where a supraglottic airway device was used, seven were successful, seven failed, five were with a classic LMA, one with ProSeal and one with an intubating LMA. Incidentally, all the five with a classic LMA were done with an entry intubation catheter, possibly supporting uh, the recommendation for this device in the DAS guidelines. So the recommendation here is that all anesthetists should be trained in this low-skill rescue intubation technique through a supraglottic airway device. 
I'll just skip those. So it is nearly about what uh, 40, 45 years then since uh, fiber optic uh, technology was introduced in anesthesia. Nearly 40 years since uh, the first awake intubation uh, was performed, and we're still sort of worried about uh, people having these uh, skills on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll just leave you with this quote from Let uh, Andy Ovasapian. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.